Good, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming today. We are on our uh, second session of Voices from History Past, and we're thrilled to gather today to learn more about Hutchinson's fascinating history. Paula had just told me she read the book. I'm like, I still need to read the book, so i got to catch up on my librarian duties. Um, before we begin, I want us to say a thank you again to Historic Hutchinson, especially for Valerie, who's sitting there. Thank you. I know she's like, why? No, it's been fantastic. I, I said this during the, the first session, but the value that that community group brings to our community is unbelievable, and I've been waiting for a very long time to partner, so I greatly appreciate being able to share this um, series this summer. Today we're thrilled to welcome historian Jim Fahey to our library. Like Bill Arndt, Jim really does not need an introduction, but I did one anyway. Um, and we're very grateful for him for taking the time to share some of Hutchinson's history with us today. Today's pre presentation is called Building a City on Purpose, so please give a warm Hutchinson welcome to Jim Fahey. Thank you. Well, historic Hutchinson uh, has a mission statement. And our mission is to restore and to preserve and to protect the living and structural history and spirit of the Hutchinson area and to showcase these assets now and in the future. That's our mission. And uh, that came from the Blandon Community Leadership Program. Uh, way back, uh, uh, 24 years ago, I think it was, Virgil, they took 30 of us and they sent us up to Sugar Lake Lodge, the Blandon Community Leadership Program. And uh, we spent a week together and we talked about things that we would like to see happen in Hutchinson. Uh, I happened to be uh, uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce Board at that time. Uh, Virgil uh, Voigt was there, and a lot of great things came out of there. Uh, historic Hutchinson, Harvard, Minnesota Animal Shelter, New Century Charter School, Babes Giving Back, uh, Crow River Area Youth Orchestra. Most of those organizations are still there. When you think about that, that was a pretty powerful group. It was a fun group. We had a good time but we really dove into Hutchinson to try to uh, uh, bring the best out and to serve our community. And when we came back, the first thing we did was to uh, develop this mission statement for historic Hutchinson. So Hutchinson, Minnesota, we've been telling the story for a long time. Uh, and it was founded in 1855. And when you think about it, um, it was, uh, really the new frontier, the wild, wild, the beginning of the wild, wild west. And during that time, the Hutchinson family singers, the Hutchinson brothers, had decided that they were going to go out west, and they were going to go to Kansas, and they were going to found a town and name it after their family. <coughs> and while they were planning their trip all the way back in Lynn, Massachusetts, um, an extended family member by marriage named W.W. W. Pendergast, said, you know, before you go to Kansas, you should check out this area west of the St. Anthony, where the big woods meets the prairie. And um, he said, it's a beautiful area, and it's going to be a state soon. And it's, it's just amazing, because it has all this wildlife, but it has also open spaces. And most of us realize, or, or if you were around and go up and high, up and down Highway 15, we noticed that, that this is where the big woods meets the prairie. The original Savannah Forest ends here. So if you go to St. Bonnie and look around, it looks a lot like Wisconsin. But if we travel to Cosmos and look around, it looks a lot like South Dakota. And this is where the Savannah Forest ended, and that's why the Sioux were here. It was a great place to live for the Sioux, because they had uh, wood, the forest, the small game, the large game, and, uh, and the open area. So um, he advised them of that, and they head out from Lynn, Massachusetts and decided to take his advice. And they ended up in St. Anthony, St. Paul, and they rented a couple of wagons, and they followed the river down, and followed the river back up, and ended up in Glencoe where they hired a local guide. And they're looking for this place to found a town and name it after themselves. So they follow the Hassan River. It was Hassan. Hassan meant maple, hard maple in the Sioux Indian language. So it wasn't always the Crow River. It was the Hassan River. And that's how people traveled. Even though it wasn't a navigable river, they followed the river 
because you knew where it was going once you'd been there once. And they got to the area where Bisky is, and they absolutely fell in love with it. Now, for those of us that have worked in the egg community for years and we're on the road a lot, um, when you drive through Bisky, uh, it is really beautiful. Uh, certain times of the year. It's in this low, expansive area, and to the east is this bluff of, bluff of trees, usually. Um, uh, you know, in the fall, the fog hangs in there, and it's really a pretty little area, and they absolutely fell in love with it. And their local guide said, if you like the looks of this, just trust me, stick with me. Stick with me another seven miles. And when the Hassan River bends to the west, you're going to see the same exact thing only a thousand times bigger. So that's what they did. They followed the river, and when it bent to the west, they absolutely fell in love with the site because of the bluff of trees and the Hassan winding through it. Now the Hassan didn't look like it did now. Of course, it was just a little trickle. Some of us will remember most recently when they put the new dam in, they drained the, the reservoir, the river, and that's what the river originally looked like. It was just this little trickle of water that ran through. And that was Hutchinson's very first tradition. Because to this day, many of us can't travel from Glencoe to Hutchinson without stopping for a short time in Bisky. <laughs> <laughs> November. <laughs> November of 1855, over where the water treatment, the fresh water treatment plant is, up on the hill, is where they made their camp. November. And they had some big ideas for their town. Lots of big vision. The first thing they did was they founded their twin cities. Now, there was a state statute that towns could only be 320 acres at the time. But they had a vision for a much larger town. So they were musicians, and everything south of the Hassan River was Hutchinson. And everything north of the Hassan River, actually, including the Hassan River, started about Washington Avenue. Everything north was Harmony, Minnesota. And they were traveling with a bunch of movers and shakers, including W.W. W. Kennedy. Um, but they had this big vision. And uh, one of the people they were traveling with was Lewis Harrington. He was a government surveyor. And um, he would really prove to be one of the most critical uh, uh, citizens of early Hutchinson. Uh, because the Hutchinsons were not very good business people. They were singers. They were abolitionists. Um, uh, they sang a lot of um, and wrote a lot of uh, Christian music that was kind of borderline protest, and uh, uh, that's about all they knew. But they laid out their town with the help of Harrington, their twin cities. And a lot of the town's streets were named after family members, but also musical terms, and also um, uh, uh, composers. We had a Handel Street, we had a Mozart Street. We still have a Harmony Lane. We still have a Lynn Road because they were from Lynn, Massachusetts. All right? So a lot of those things survived. Many of them didn't, though, because we got extremely creative in subsequent years and renamed the streets first, second, third. <laughs> I'm going to pass this around, and you can take a look at that original drawing. Uh, this original plat done by Lewis Harrington for a fee of $380 is a design for the original towns. And it has some unique things in it for the time. So that was their big, their big vision for Hutchinson. It wasn't long after that the state statutes changed and towns could be twice as big. So instead of two 320 acre towns, the original town site of, the, of Hutchinson became 640 acres. And that was the original town site. But um, they had this first night worked on their Articles of Incorporation. Now they talk about just the corporate stuff and who owns what. The Hutchinsons each had shares, but Harrington ended up with all the land on this side of the river. 
because he was a good businessman. Um, and it uh, talked about meetings, but some interesting things. Think about this. Um, Lewis Harrington would get paid three hundred and eighty dollars uh, for planning the town. Five acres shall be set aside for the Humanities Church. Fifteen acres shall be set aside for a park. After that, was in, it was increased to twenty-two acres. And eight lots shall be reserved for education. And they would all be together. Interesting concept. Church, public education, okay, at a park. Now, that first um, statement from them makes our park system, that park, the second oldest Platt's Park, Platted Park, uh, that's in, uh, North Park, the second oldest Platt's Park in the United States. Now, there were many parks that were old, but they were just parks that were on pub public or private property, but they weren't designated for parks. But you'll notice in Harrington's drawing, um, that park and church and education area is drawn out from the beginning. The oldest platted park in uh, the United States is Central Park, actually platted, designed as a park, and from it was a park from the very beginning. But check this out. It is solemnly decreed that in the future of Hutchinson, women shall enjoy equal rights with the men. November 1855. These guys were wacko for their time. Because <laughs> just think about how long it took for women in America to get to vote after that. And in 1855, the first time they sit around the fire and start working on these things, that's one of the things that was important to them. And also, no pool halls. So, Women had early rights. Pool halls didn't have any rights. We also ended up with a few pool halls over the years. But that's interesting. So they had this vision for early and continued growth. And Harrington was a big part of that. Now in 1858, Lewis Harrington built his house. The Harrington Merrill House. We know it as the Harrington Merrill House at 225 Washington Avenue West. And that's the site. Uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places, and it was, um, it is actually Historic Hutchinson's flagship project. Uh, to be able to uh, uh, save the house uh, um, through uh, a joint agreement with Historic Hutchinson, a, a 501c3 nonprofit, and the city of Hutchinson, uh, Historic Hutchinson agreed that if the city took the property uh, when it was offered to them through tax forfeiture, that Historic Hutchinson would do all of the funding. If they would just take the property, make it part of the park system, and work with us, take care of the lawn, lawn uh, we would raise all the funds to rehab the property. And we are just finishing up the outside of the, of the property. Um, and when we're done, it'll be pretty much finished uh, on the outside. It is on the National Register of Historic Places, so it's a national uh, landmark. And the three buildings, uh, the barn just showed up here a year ago last February. Uh, we drove it back across town and got a new roof last two weeks ago. And uh, now we'll start working on the cupola and getting the exterior done. But this is what the site looked like in 1858, and it was a flurry of activity because Harrington was a government servant. So when you came to the Hutchinson area, and one of the reasons that Hutchinson was so important, and one, one of the reasons it had more growth than other communities was because of Harrington. Uh, because this is where you went, and your family would most likely stay with the Harringtons in their big house. Uh, While well, the man of the house would go out with Mr. Harrington and Harrington and show him where his 80 acre stake was, and probably work on building a small shelter and then coming back and getting his family and moving on. The very first uh, post office in Hutchinson was right at the original point 
vantage point by the end of the east driveway there. Uh, because, again, that was kind of the center of activity. There wasn't really a downtown. In 1862, what little had been built was totally burned down during the Dakota Uprising. And the Harrington Merrill House and the property was spared. And the stockade. The stockade was located uh, just uh, to the north of this building. It was right up here. And um, everyone who made it to the stockade during the uprising survived. Now one person uh, died. The interesting thing about it is that the menfolk were busy taking care of the farms, fighting, and the, it was the women uh, who actually convinced uh, 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 everyone that they should have their own stockade. And the women did the shooting. Uh, so Mrs. Harrington was a big part of that. She was truly a community leader. And they built the stockade. And there's a story about uh, the Sumner store. Uh, Mr. Sumner owned a general store downtown. And before the town was burnt down, he offered any young lad a brand new pair of boots if during the fighting he would run down to the store and pick up supplies and bring it back to the stockade. Many of them took it up. As a side note, later, after the uprising, the Sumners had a son. His name was Perry Sumner. Uh, he missed the whole thing because he wasn't born yet. Uh, but he was the first person ever buried in, in Oakland Cemetery uh, because there was not a formal cemetery. And Mrs. Sumner didn't want um, her son just buried out on the prayer. So that's what, that's how the Oakland Cemetery came. So 1862 stockade and the 1858 Harrington Merrill House survive. Now a lot of things started to happen in Hutchinson and people started to flock here. Um, and one of the important people that came here was a guy by the name of John Adams. John Adams came here with his family from England, and he was kind of a mover and a shaker. And he built his first house. He had five children. He lived in the house with his five children. And um, um, <coughs> he was political. He was an entrepreneur. He ran for the state legislature and represented both political parties on the ticket. He went to the Republican uh, convention and got their nomination, and he went to the Democratic convention and he got their nomination. So he had pretty much tied up. Uh, he later became a judge, Judge John Adams. And he was a mover and a shaker. And he usually kept this area of the state, which was now a state, uh, on the forefront of things and kept them informed. So Hutchinson was very lucky to have him uh, as a, a prominent citizen. Uh, and he, he, he did well. Uh, we found some of his records, um, like uh, you would be fined two dollars if you buried your horse in the alley. <coughs> All right. By 1880, the population in Hutchinson was 800 people. Think about that. That's, the, that's a lot of people from 1855 to 1880. So um, uh, there, there, there got to be a lot of people. And then the railroads started showing up. Three railroads, unheard of in a small rural community. You notice the years. The 1886 Milwaukee Railroad ran from Glencoe to Hutchinson. So it ended right over here. If you've ever wondered why, when you're driving down Fifth Avenue, you drive past all these 100-year-old houses, and then you drive past one block of 1960s um, apartment buildings, and then you cross Adams and you're back to 100-year-old houses. Well, that's because that's the end of that Milwaukee Railroad line that ran between Glencoe and Hutchinson. And you might think, well, that's kind of odd. What's the purpose of that little railroad? Well, there was a race going on because the Manitoba line in 1880s, that opened in 1887 ran from Hutchinson to Hopkins. That's the 
evolved into the Dakota line, and that's the depot that sits down there now. So there was a race. Why would they be racing? Why would that be being so important? Because Mount Milwaukee, um, the Milwaukee Railroad, by servicing the area first, got all of the contracts to deliver supplies, lumber, and all kinds of things. So they could perform before the Manitoba line. Uh, so much of that, those items came out of the line to Glencoe, the main line to Glencoe, and then got transferred to that little railroad, and that little railroad service such and such. And then in 1908, the big one, the loose line came, and that put pressure on all of them because that was that continuous line uh, that ran all the way up to the west. Railroads were important to uh, the growth of the community. We had three of them, and they were all pretty viable for a long, long time. So that is another reason why Hutchinson continued to grow and uh, actually um, do so well. So it just kept growing. Now, it's a, uh, we say that this is the Bretzky building. Actually, in the tour now, that's been updated to the Severin building. And it sits right over here on the corner. And, uh, but that was built, and that was, a, that was a pretty extensive building in 1888, when you think about it. Three stories tall, had been rehabbed, um, but 1888, uh, well, it was, it was uh, uh, pretty uh, darn uh, prestigious to have a building like that. The, the town, keep in mind, is not very old. And in 1891 came our first event center. The 1891 Fall to my building. And that's where the opera house was, upstairs. It's still up there. But if you drive along uh, 2nd Avenue uh, and uh, look, uh, you can see the double doors and the stairs, the big wide stairs that we go up through the top. So there was a discrepancy because this uh, building came three years after the Severin building, and there seemed to be a little discrepancy in whose building was the tallest. And uh, so <laughs> one uh, Monday night, Monday nights were the big nights in town. That's when uh, uh, the stores were all open and people would, would socialize on Monday nights. And there could have been alcohol involved, you never know. But they, a bunch of guys went down to the fire station, borrowed some ladders, and they measured the two buildings. And indeed, the Severite building beat um, the, um, the uh, Tamai building by 11 and a half inches. It was 11 and a half inches tall. So, in case you ever wanted to know, that one was the true skyscraper. In 1892, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Judge Adams, um, uh, who was an Episcopalian, was constantly after the Episcopal Diocese to build a church here. And Bishop Whipple um, always pushed back at him because he said, you know, John, there are not very many Episcopalians there. Why would you want to build a church? But he had some double, and he had some influence, and he donated the land, and uh, Bishop Whipple gave him permission to build this little church in 1892. And um, they built the church, but Bishop Whipple didn't give him a pastor. The pastor was shared with Glenco because there were very many Episcopalians. This is also a joint project between Historic Hutchinson and the City of Hutchinson. Uh, we were able to get our hands on this uh, during the crash of 2008, soon through some creative donations. And uh, we were uh, really glad to get it and to redo it. Uh, we spent about $100,000 uh, redoing that uh, with all the support from the community, 50 some thousand dollars in, in uh, windows, I think $54,000, uh, redoing the windows. Uh, Jeff Haig redid the floors for us. Plumbing and heating by Craig, Nate uh, uh, Johnson, uh, and he uh, engaged the train company, and they donated um, heating and air conditioning for the building, and plumbing and heating by Craig put it in. Uh, E-square electrical, did all the electrical. 
So this also is part of the park system. You can rent it just like a park shelter. It's one of Hutchinson's really best kept secrets. Uh, right now it hosts several weddings a year, but it's available. It's available just for regular meetings or for book meetings. We've had folk shows in there. We've had small musical productions in there. It has pretty good acoustics, and it's all original on the inside. Um, is there anyone that has not been in that building ever? It sits right over here. Never have been in it. All right. Well, the next time you have the opportunity to go on a historic Hutchinson tour, a bus tour, um, uh, just show up because uh, we go into that building and we, we talk about some of the architecture. It's fascinating architecture uh, because it was Episcopalian and it was extremely influenced um, by Europe. Uh, so it is Gothic architecture, but there's no steeple. There's no bell. So it doesn't look like our little Irish Catholic churches or our little German Lutheran churches that we see all over the Midwest. Uh, the closest one uh, to this one is in Belle Plaine, which is a real similar uh, look, except the, all of the framing is on the outside of the building. It has that similar look. But anyway, uh, a nice little asset. So 1892, we're up to 1892. Uh, there are a few churches. In 1869, remember that uh, uh, land set aside for the church? Harrington actually donated all of that land where North Park is and um, where Park Elementary was built and where in 1869 the Hutchinson brothers decided they want to build a new humanities church. And they're not good business people, and they don't have any money. So they take their show back on the road with their abolitionist music, and they go back to where they come from on the East Coast. And they travel up and down the East Coast. And while they're performing in Martha's Vineyard, the people of Martha's Vineyard give them a bell for their new church. Now that gives you kind of a warm and fuzzy feeling, but I always think about the guy that was in charge of logistics for that trip. How do you get a bell back here from, Mass, uh, from uh, um, Martha's Vineyard in 1869? But anyway, they did it, and they put it up in the church, and it served that church. And that church stood there for 100 years, 100 years until the late 1960s, early 1970s, when the existing congregation went out to the corner of School Road and Southgate Road and built their new church. And they took the bell with them and named their church, their congregation, Vineyard United Methodist Church, in honor, of course, of the symbol of the vineyard in the Christian religion, but also in honor of the people from Martha's Vineyard who gave them that bell. It's one of the most historic assets in Hutchinson. It hides in plain sight every time you drive past that because that bell tower is open. And you can look up and you can see that 1869 bell with the huge pole that was a gift to the people of Hutchinson uh, from the people of Martha's Vineyard. Kind of an interesting story. Of course, we're long on churches. Uh, it would be a whole symposium itself. It would take several hours to talk about uh, the 40-some churches that are in Hutchinson. But we've got a lot. And then, of course, this building. In 1902, Andrew Carnegie offered $10,000 to any community that wanted a library. Now, when you think about that, any community, uh, and Hutchinson took him up on it. And that's very forward thinking. So up until, uh, up until that time, this was referred to as the town square. But in 1902, he built the Carnegie Library and um, uh, renamed it Library Square. And I always give uh, the folks at City Hall a hard time over this library because I say that's how bad habits got started. Because he gave them 10000 and they spent 12000 And then they sent a letter and asked them for the difference. <laughs> and he sent it to them. <laughs> bad deal. <laughs> this was the first building in McLeod County to go on the National Register of Historic Places. So again, this is a, a federal historic landmark that we sit in today because of it. And in the late 1970s, when Linda and I came to town, the discussion was that the library wasn't big enough. 
and it was going to be torn down. And possibly a new library built in its place or somewhere else. And maybe out by the high school. And a local architect, John Corngable, still alive, he said, let me work with this. Let me try to figure this out. And he gave our community one of the nicest gifts he could. Because this library got pressed into that black glass building. And the next time you're over at Flanks having a glass of wine, look out the window because you're centered on this building. And you focus on the building and you totally lose the fact that it has been tripled in size because he set it against that black glass wall. And it's amazing, really, because now it's publicly owned, it's just like the Harrington Merrill House. It's on the National Register, so it truly is protected forever. Many of these libraries got into disrepair. They fell into private hands. You know, they were converted. There was one in Litchfield that was a Chinese restaurant. It still stands. I don't know what's in it now, but it was just kind of a mess. And there's just a lot of them. We have run across them as we travel uh, around the country. And you'll just you'll see one off in a corner. And, and very seldom do you find one that looks as good as this one. So it's truly a tribute to the folks in Hutchinson. So, things are pretty good for Judge Adams. He's doing pretty well. So, in 1902, he picks up that little house that he built in 1874, <coughs> and he flips it around, and he faces it the other way, and moves it to the back of the lot. And he builds this large um, English home that uh, is uh, uh, designed by English architects. And uh, it was pretty prominent. That was Nob the Hill. And he uh, was a pretty private guy, even though he led a pretty public life. Um, there was one article in the paper during the construction, uh, and he's, it said that uh, the cost of the house uh, had so far surpassed $8,000. He uh, is known to have gone down to the newspaper office, and the house was never mentioned again uh, during its construction. <laughs> so uh, it's only had two families in it. Uh, Walter Quast uh, uh, bought it in 1950. That's where George lives now. A lot of similarities. Mr. Adams didn't live in the house that long. He passed away uh, at an early age. His wife then passed away. Yeah, I think they had five children. I think two of them stayed in town. Um, and Mariah was a singer, or at least she thought she was. So we have heard stories about she would be standing up on the widow's watch uh, singing opera tunes. And the youngest son, and I'm sorry his, uh, his uh, name escapes me, uh, was an alcoholic, uh, kind of drank himself to death. He was the last one, but he did live into his 70s. But he was a very interesting person. There's a famous photo of him. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, it is uh, taken on Christmas Eve in Berlin during World War II. And it is uh, of uh, Mr. Adams playing the piano. And he's surrounded by US soldiers. And they're singing Christmas hymns. And it's a picture taken from the front door of the church, of the piano, and the soldiers. And the roof is totally blown off of this cathedral. But they found the piano, and they decided to sing Christmas carols. So imagine the things that he came back to Hutchinson with, uh, and probably explained a lot about his uh, alcohol abuse and, uh, and uh, the abuse of himself. Uh, no one else. But that's an interesting story. I always draw a parallel between George and that guy, except that I always tell George, he's too cheap to drink. <laughs> <laughs> in 1912, think about this, it was actually a paint factory, not a paint store, but a paint, paint factory. And G.F. Nimitz and Sons, the Benjamin fam family, uh, that was, that was a, a kind of a big deal. People came from all over, and Hutchinson 
was kind of this mega uh, place that had a lot of these different stores. And, and uh, that's one of the reasons why the Nimitz was so important. Um, because when you think about, uh, we're going to talk about some of the inter industry that, that came along in Hutchinson. When you think about Stearns, uh, there were just a lot of interesting stories about Stearns Lumber. They were like Menards. They had lumber yards in Hutchinson, Brompton, Buffalo Lake, Hector, Cosmos. And uh, they, they were a real powerhouse. You know, at that time, you could order a house from Sears, and they would send, send it out on the railroad. It was all pre-cut. All your contractor had to do was read the blueprints and put it together. There are very few, if any, Sears houses in Hutchinson. Why? Because Stearns could beat them. They could beat the prices. Uh, so there's a lot of Sears designed houses. You could just buy the blueprints, but then you would take the blueprints and your local contractor would go to Stearns. Fascinating story from local business people. In 1913, Merton S. Goodnow, who was a dentist, um, he uh, married a shepherd girl, and, and the shepherds were medical doctors. He was a dentist. They gave him this chunk of land in the corner of Fifth Avenue and Main Street, and they built a prairie house. In his obituary, when he died in 1870, um, I'm sorry, he was born in 1870 and uh, died in... Uh, on the 4th of July, sometime after 1913, 1920, I guess, or 30. And uh, he, uh, um, in his obituary, it says every, every time he did a project, he had improved the looks of Hutchinson. It was important to him. He was very uh, active in the Masonic Temple. And that group, the Masons in town, uh, whose building used to sit right over here, they were really movers and shakers. They moved the community forward. He was one of them. Uh, but anyhow, uh, he found Purcell and Elmsley, and he built this prairie house uh, in 1913. It is the only private residence in McLeod County on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's very unusual that it's here. Uh, they built houses all over the United States, but very few uh, in Minnesota, and only one in Hutchinson. They built a lot of banks, and actually their closest piece of work is Hector. Uh, they built a bank in Hector. So next time you drive past that, look at that, and you'll see that it has some really interesting architectural features. But you can see that the town is now moving forward. So you've got Judge Adams' house on one corner, the doctor's office in the middle, where the Bucks live now, the Goodno Shepherd House, and now the Goodno House on the corner. And kitty corner from that was the Stearns House, okay? Kitty corner from this house is the Stearns House. So we're starting to develop a little momentum in, in um, wealth and uh, in, in status, creating a lifting, if you will, uh, the town and setting, setting it apart from other towns. In 1926, the Jurgensen Hotel, the previous hotel burnt down, and Mr. Jurgensen said, I'm building a hotel and I want it to be fireproof. And he did. Um, and that is totally fireproof. There's no wood in that building, um, uh, structurally. Uh, and um, that project has been put on hold because of construction costs and, and interest rates. Um, so it was kind of a $3 million project that turned into $4.5 million. So uh, it's been put on hold uh, for the short term, but it is owned by a developer out of Duluth. And they have every intention of turning it uh, into um, uh, a boutique hotel uh, to complement um, their property that they already own in town, which is Cobblestone. So uh, the best is yet to come with that hotel, um, but again, uh, interest rates and, and construction costs uh, make it more difficult to cash flow. In 1926. In 1937, the State Theater opened in all its glory, um, December of 1937. Its first show was True Confessions. I think it cost 35 cents to go. This was really Hutchinson's first mall, when you think about it. Uh, it had seven apartments. They called them high-end apartments at that time, upstairs. And uh, the big auditorium. 
uh, plus a couple of storefronts uh, uh, next to it. So it was uh, uh, kind of an important uh, addition to downtown. If you think about it, in 1937, uh, um, uh, there were some tough times. The Hutchinson was still showing growth and being pretty progressive. Um, one of the things that happened in 1937 was Hutchinson's very first, uh, with, with McLeod County's very first funeral home. Funeral homes were a new concept. Uh, they uh, started uh, on the East Coast, but there were very few in Minnesota. Uh, up until then, all the visitations took place in the living room or the parlor of the family's house. And um, Walter Quast um, uh, decided to buy this existing house and convert it to a funeral home. And you might say, well, was it really that big of a deal? The population of Hutchinson in 1937 was 3,200 people. He opened it up for a weekend for people to come and see what a funeral home looked like. And 3,800 people showed up. <laughs> so it was a new concept. It was really outside the box. Can you imagine the conversations about um, displaying your love for them, but not in your own home? I'm sure there were all kinds of conversations. Too bad they didn't have Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure we could have got all kinds of opinions. And then in 1947, the hemp plant closes because there's no more need for rope. The hemp work for the government. So this hemp plant provided a lot of rope to the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy. And the hemp plant closed, and some leaders in the community uh, engaged uh, with uh, Mr. McKnight. McKnight was from St. Paul. He was a scientist, and he was experimenting with plastics and adhesives. And he was looking for a place for his community uh, to make this product and experiment with it. And uh, the guy in charge of Citizens Bank, Mr. Kurth, he engaged him, showed them um, the hemp plant. And after a couple weeks, he said, I just can't do it. You don't have enough water. You just don't have enough water to the building. And um, um, a group of downtown business people and community leaders got together and they discussed what their options were. And their they decided to go forward and give Mr. McKnight the infrastructure uh, for the water. He still had to pay for his water, but they would get it to him. Could you imagine today that discussion, again with Facebook? I don't know about you, but I think that was a pretty good move. Because today, that facility is 1.4 million square feet. Isn't that amazing? And just think of the lives uh, that it has touched uh, since 1947. In addition to the lives it's touched, it has affected a lot of other businesses and spin-offs. We talk about a city on purpose. Let's take a quick look at our industry. And I am not even touching on it. There are so many more small companies. The Global Fixture Company, True Survivors, started as a cabinet company. When we came to town in the 1970s, it had 70% of the world market for knife blocks. 70% of the world market in knife blocks. Because they had the Chicago Cutlery contract. When the Chinese took that away from them, they had to reinvent their company. And they became a high-end store fixture company. So when you would walk into all of these different uh, high-end department stores, like Von Moore, or Neiman Marcus. And you would notice that the Tommy Hilfiger look all looked the same in all of those, or name brands such as that. And what that was was product from Global Fixtures, who would go into those stores, and they did that for decades, and install um, that look in each of the stores so it had a consistent look to it. And of course, uh, we know that retail has changed a lot, and they've reinvented their company again, still doing special projects and high-end store fixtures, but they're also making cabinets again for all of those high-rise and new apartments that are being built all across the country, uh, 
sell, selling 200 kitchens at a time and delivering them to uh, large cities. So that's amazing. Stern's what we talked about. Again, started as a lumber yard uh, and has evolved into a high-end packaging uh, a company uh, with both cardboard and uh, wood packaging. And uh, they package a lot of big names. Their clients include Graco, the Grease People, um, Toro, uh, at one time uh, GE uh, Engines. Uh, um, they just did a lot. When we came to town, Hutchinson had technology had 70% of the world market in suspension units and computers. Think about that. A little piece. There was a 7 out of 10 chance that every computer in the world had a little spring in it that came from Hutchinson. And um, they've had some harder times um, and probably didn't develop as fast as they could have or should have or diversified, but they still are there. They employ people. Uh, they're owned by a Japanese company now. Upener uh, is a, a, a company that is on that Hutchinson Technology campus. And uh, they um, do all of the poly, like the Wurzbo um, heating when you put it in the new houses now. Uh, most of that is an Aquapex piping uh, for water. That's what they make. And Mitke, uh, our new tenant downtown that's uh, taken over the old Shopco building. Uh, they're not in there yet, uh, but uh, they do a, a lot of uh, grinding, uh, a lot of government contracts, and uh, um, uh, tooling manufacturing. Hutchinson Manufacturing is all, probably the, one of the largest job shops in the area. Um, I remember a long time ago when cell phones were new, uh, uh, Disney decided to put a cell phone a huge 60-foot cell phone in front of each one of their uh, hotels. And those cell phones uh, were fabricated here in Hutchinson and shipped all over to their uh, properties. Also, if you've ever been to downtown Chicago in one of the high rises and you look out over Lake Michigan, you'll see the, uh, um, the water intakes uh, out in the water, uh, it's the Chicago water supply. Uh, that's when they take their water out of the lake, and there's these big covers on them that are shaped like spools and spokes, and those are all fabricated here in Hutchinson by Hutchinson Manufacturing. Right way conveyors, uh, they're a sleeper. They used to be out on Highway 7 over by Lester Prairie. They have a new facility out in our industrial park. Uh, they built all this animated conveyor systems uh, for like FedEx and UPS. You see those on the uh, on the TV once in a while, those thinking conveyor systems, that's what they do. Um, Pride Solutions has a bunch of different companies, but their most uh, 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 prominent one in this area probably be in the ag community is May West. Uh, May West has aftermarket uh, plastic products for like combine heads and all that stuff. Impressions. Impressions is a, a St. Paul company, but they have a huge facility here in Hutchinson and they print all of the packaging for 3M uh, for the products that come out of the 3M plant. So a great partnership there. Uh, Fire Lake Manufacturing is a 20,000 square foot uh, um, uh, facility uh, on Highway 7 East, uh, and they build um, uh, animal uh, carcass incinerators, and they send them all over the country. Big animals, little animals, they. They build inventories uh, for animals. So you think about that, there's just a lot of things that happen because around that fire that night, they decided they want to have a big town, a big community. And they weren't going to take no for an answer. The Hutchinsons were really lucky because they surrounded themselves with Harrington and with Pendergast, and shortly thereafter, um, John Adams. And some of those leaders that uh, uh, kept coming, uh, and then to get the service groups, like the, the Masonic Temple, here. Huge, really huge. So Hutchinson is a city on purpose, but it's not an accident. Uh, it, it, and we are so fortunate, because as you travel around uh, on your summer vacations or your winter vacations, you can drive through a lot of towns that are the size of Hutchinson, or used to be the size of Hutchinson, that are looking pretty tough. 
And while we have some empty buildings, we are uh, better off than most. Uh, and that's kind of important. Yes? I've never seen that picture of the barn. And the, where did that come from? Is that a real picture that you showed it early on? Oh, no. That is not. Um, that is um, a rendition done by um, Jensen, Steve Jensen, who uh, does a lot of uh, historic architect work. And uh, so this rendition of the site is something that uh, we have done uh, through research, because we needed to do that to figure out what the barn looked like. It's kind of an interesting story. If you look at that barn, it's sitting there in its underwear now. We're not done yet. It just has a new roof. But um, that, that one? Mm -hmm. that yeah. So that's a rendition. And we had to um, determine how the barn looked because it had been converted to a house. What happened is in the 1940s, the house was slid down to the river and made into a house. The barn was slid down and made into a house, and it was the group home. Right? And uh, when the city ended up uh, buying the group home and getting ready to demo it, Historic Hutchinson had heard from Jay Byteen, one of our members who is now deceased, that that was the original barn from the Harrington Merrill property. So once the city had it, we went in and did our research and found that it truly was a barn. And we had some accounts that it was the barn from the Harrington Merrill property. So what we had to do, Kate, is to uh, determine what the barn looked like. And we found out early on that the barn was cut off. About uh, the bottom two feet was cut off and it was converted to a house. And that's why you'll see that the, the bottom two feet has now been added back on. And um, um, if you go and look at it, it's kind of fun to look at it right now because all the siding is off. Of it. And you can see where the old windows were that were filled in and where the new windows were put in that will be refilled in. You can walk around and you can see where the hay mound door is. And um, uh, we had to figure out the orientation of it and we have the orientation correct because it's very functional. Because once we gutted the inside of it, we could see how high the uh, headers were above the door. That helped us determine the height. And we visited uh, four other barns in Hutchinson that were smaller, but they all had a consistent header height. So that told us how much we had to raise the barn up. Uh, so it's been a really interesting, uh, a really interesting uh, project, and this will be it. Then, then, then this site will be finished. And we're really, we're really excited about it because that enables us to do more of this. Because if you uh, uh, remember our uh, um, mission statement is uh, to preserve and to prove. To restore, to preserve, and to protect the living and structural history. The living and structural history. So we've got a few decades of structural stuff to do on the front end so we can get to the living history and tell the story. And we're just getting there now. We're just getting there now. So it's, it's a lot of fun. We've got a lot of projects uh, coming up. Um, another thing I wanted to just let people know is that the, the clock, where the heck is that clock? Uh, the clock is being refurbed by a company called the uh, uh, Mechanical Watch Supply, and that's what this guy does. He happens to be from the Twin Cities, but he does work all over the country. And I've seen pictures. Uh, he's putting it back together um, and um, uh, powder coating it and all that, and that will go back up in front of Hager Jewelry. It won't say Hager Jewelry on it anymore. It'll just say Historic Hutchinson. But Historic Hutchinson purchased, raised the money, uh, from some gracious donors uh, uh, to purchase the clock and then to have the clock uh, restored. It's a $30,000 project to purchase and restore the clock. Uh, so, so far, uh, since our, our beginning, uh, we have, since Sugar Lake Lodge, we have uh, raised uh, 500, about $550,000 and reinvested that all back into the community uh, we don't have, we're totally volunteer driven. Uh, we don't have any staff, we have no paid staff. 
uh, and because uh, Valerie works her tail off for nothing, it's great. Um, um, and, and the other thing that is, is we have a real viable group, uh, young people, which is amazing to us. Uh, New Century Charter School has been a great partner. We meet the first Monday of every month at 6.30 p.m. at the depot. And it's air conditioned. So, <laughs> and um, you can be as active as you want. There's no membership, there's no dues, there's nothing like that. Some people uh, will just help with one or two things. We um, co-host Music in the Park. Uh, Music in the Park was going to go away. The Chamber of Commerce wasn't going to do it anymore. So Historic Hutchinson and um, um, Riverside took that over four years ago, five years ago, five years ago now, uh, to keep that alive. Uh, so, uh, because we think it's that particular thing is important uh, for our heritage. We will do our, our uh, we've done a cemetery tour. Uh, this year's tour, I believe, will be a, a riding tour uh, on, the, on the, you know, the people movers from uh, the Orange Spectacular. We've been doing that the last couple of years. Um, uh, we have a, historic, uh, a hidden Hutchinson tour that we do periodically, uh, where things that you don't get to see very often uh, that are kind of hidden away in basements, and, and uh, there are some fascinating artifacts out there. And uh, also we do a haunted Hutchinson tour, um, which is uh, uh, not creepy with chainsaws or anything like that, uh, but just talks about some of the more spooky stories, some of the folklore and history that's been passed on. Any other questions? Well, great. I never go anywhere without my historic Hutchinson envelopes. <laughs> so if you would like one, they're right up here in the staff. But in the meantime, thanks, Kate. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. But it really, this is just phenomenal. It's so much important history as we go forward. And to, to have it upstairs in our program space in our new library makes it's like a librarian's dream come true. So <laughs> thank you. And to see such familiar faces and all your support and all touches and support and all stuff. Yeah. But thank you very much for coming. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you.